Hello mathematicians, thank you for joining me today. We're going to be talking about cardinalities today, or the size of different sets. The first thing I want to note is that if we have finite sets, and let's suppose that we have a mapping which is an injection, then what I claim is that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. Or if we have a mapping from A to B which is a surjection, or it's onto, then the cardinality of B has to be less than or equal to the cardinality of A. So what we get is using these com together is that if I have a bijection from A to B, then that has to be the case that the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of B because, well, since it's a one to one, we have the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. And since it's on to the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A, hence they have to be precisely the same. All right, so the idea here is that we're gonna have mappings from a set A to a set B. And I just want to show at least a proof by picture of what's going on here. The idea is that if I can find some mapping, let's say alpha from A to B, where this is onto, what does that mean? Well, that means that for every B here, I can find some element here. So and for a B here, I can find some element here. Now, what I can't have is, say, this picture where this one is covering these two things because if this one is covering these two things this is not a mapping or a function so I can't have that picture so the idea is that for everything in B I can find some unique element of A which gets mapped to that element in B therefore every time I put an element here I have to put another one here and it has to be a new one because it can't be one of the old ones otherwise it's not a mapping so what happens is, is for every element in here, I get at least one element in here. So if I can find an onto mapping from A to B, that means that there has to be at least as many elements in A as in B. So the cardinality of A is greater than or equal to the cardinality of B. Now it can be bigger because I can have two things going down to one, but it has to be at least as big as the cardinality of B. On the other hand, if I have a one-to-one -one mapping, what that means is, well, every element in here is going to get mapped to something in here. Now, I can't have this picture because that would no longer be one-to-one. -one. So whenever I pick a new element in here, so I start with this one, I add one, I have to add a new element in here. And if I'm going to add another one in here, I have to add another one in here. So every time I add one element here, I'm going to add another element here. Therefore, for everything in here, there's a unique thing in here. So there's at least as many elements in B as there are in A. There can be more because there can be things that get, don't get mapped to. But we do have to have that if we have a one-to-one -one mapping from A to B, the cardinality of A has to be less than or equal to the cardinality of B because everything in A is going to give us something in B. Now, if we combine that together, if we have a one-to-one -one onto mapping, well then, because it's one-to-one, -one, A, cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. Because it's on two, the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A. Therefore, if we can find a one-to-one -one onto mapping, these cardinalities have to be the same. Now we saw that that was the case for finite sets. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend our definitions of cardinalities for infinite sets so that we can be precise about, well, what does it mean for an infinite set to have the same cardinality as another set? Well, the idea is that two infinite sets will have the same cardinality if there exists a bijection between them. That is, if we can find a one-to-one -one onto mapping from A to B, then we would say those two infinite sets have the same cardinality. Also, we can say that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to B if there's an injective mapping from A to B, or I can find a surjective mapping from B to A. So I can use the same results about, well, if it's one to one, then the domain's smaller than the codomain. If it's on to, then the codomain's smaller than the domain. And so we can talk about different sizes of infinity, different cardinalities of infinite sets. The first one we're gonna look at is we wanna show that the size of the integers is actually the size of the natural numbers. This size we're gonna call L if not, which is up there, and so, L if not is because it is the smallest infinite cardinality. All right, so if I want to show that the cardinality of the set of integers is the same as the cardinality of the set of natural numbers, what I have to do is find a bijective mapping from Z to N or N to Z. So what I have to do is I have to just find alpha from Z to N, 
which is 1 to 1 and on to. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, I have to think, what are some different options? Well, if I just map things to the absolute value, well, I'm going to end up, other than 0, being well-defined and on to. So I'd have to find somewhere to send 0, let's say 1. So I can get a mapping that's from z on to n fairly easily. But that's not going to be 1 to 1. So what I need now is to think, well, how could I do that so that it refines it so that I end up being 1 to 1? Well, let's think about this, and let's just say, let's look at the integers and say, I have 0 as an integer. So I have to send it somewhere, so let's send it to 1. 1 is an integer, so let's send that. I already used 1, so let's use 2. Negative 1 is an integer, so let's send that to 3. 2 is an integer, so let's send that to 4. Negative 2 is an integer, so let's send that to 5. And so notice what I'm doing is I'm starting at 0 and alternating between positives and negatives. So 0 is going to go to 1. 1 is going to go to 2. Negative 1 to 3. 2 to 4. Negative 2 to 5. And I'm going to alternate between positives and negatives. Now in the end, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get all of the integers are going to be mapped to one of the natural numbers. Also, it's going to be on to because I'm going to be able to cover all the natural numbers. It's also going to be one to one because I only have one element going to each natural number. So if this is my alpha, this is going to be a one to one on to mapping. Now, if we wanted to go through and prove, we could give you know, a formal functional write-up of this. And so what I would say is that alpha of x is equal to, well, if x is positive, it's just 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 4. So alpha of x is equal to 2x if x is greater than 0. So I'm going to end up defining this piecewise. If x is negative, negative 1 goes to 3, negative 2 goes to 5. So what I'm going to get is 2 times negative x plus 1 if x is less than or equal to 0. So all I'm just saying here is 1 goes to 3. So 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. So 2 times negative negative 1 is 1. 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. 2 times negative negative 2 is 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5. So that works out. Even for 0, it works out because 2 times 0 plus 1 is 1. So I have a piecewise defined function where alpha of x is equal to this. Now, you can say, well, how is this on to? Well, I'm getting all the odd natural numbers and all the even natural numbers. Therefore, since all natural numbers are odd and even, this would have to be on to. Why is it 1 to 1? Well, if two things were equal, the images were equal. Well, if the images were even, they had to both be positive and they had to start at the same spot. If both things or if the images were odd, then they had to both be less than or equal to zero and end at the same spot, so therefore they'd have to be equal. I didn't go through a formal proof there, but that's the idea is that this will indeed be a one-to-one -one onto mapping. So the cardinality of the integers is the same as the cardinality of the natural numbers. What does that mean though? Well, what that means is that there are as many natural numbers as there are integers, which is actually counterintuitive because there are clearly integers which are not natural numbers, but every natural number is an integer. So the integer should be bigger because I have extra ones like negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and 0, and so on. However, because these are infinite cardinalities, I can find a mapping from these to these that's 1 to 1 and on to. So we're going to say that even though there are ones in here that aren't in here, there are the same number overall. So they're the same number of integers as there are natural numbers. And so there is an infinite number of each, namely what they would call L of naught, or the size of the natural numbers. All right, next we want to show is that for any set, we have that the cardinality of the power set of A is strictly greater than the cardinality of A. So we could say, well, if A was finite, then the cardinality of the power set of A would be 2 to the n, which would be strictly greater than n but for the infinite case we want to be more precise here is that we can't just say 2 to the infinity because we don't know what that means instead we actually have to show that well there does not exist a bijection therefore these will be non-equal sizes and then furthermore we'd have to find some way to show that the power set was bigger than 
the cardinality of A. All right, so now what we want to show is that the cardinality of the power set is strictly greater than the cardinality of a set. So what does that mean is, well, it means that not all sets that are infinite are going to have the same cardinality because if I start with an infinite set, I can take the power set and get a different cardinality. And so how would I prove this is, well, the idea is that to show that they are not equal, we'd have to show that there is not a bijection. And to show that the power set is bigger, I'd have to show that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of the power set. So how am I going to do that is, well, first off, I'm going to use mapping. So I'm going to define, let's say, beta from A to the power set of A as X gets mapped to, or alpha of X is equal to the set consisting of X. So I'm going to define alpha from A to the power set of A, where alpha of X is the set consisting of X. So if I start with any element in A, notice that it gets mapped to some subset of A, namely the set consisting only of X. So this is a well-defined mapping because for every element of A, this is a subset of A. Is it onto? No. There are plenty of sets outside of this, so it's not onto. Is it one to one? Well, let's suppose that the set consisting of x is equal to the set consisting of y. Well, then these have to have the same element, so x is equal to y. Therefore, if alpha of x is equal to alpha of y, x is equal to y. So this is a one-to-one -one mapping. So it is one-to-one, -one, but not onto. Well, if I find a one-to-one -one mapping, that means that the cardinality of a is less than or equal to the cardinality of the power set. So at least we know this one can be no bigger than this one. So this is less than or equal to this. Now we still have to show that they're not equal, but at least we got this one is less than or equal to this one. All right, now to show that they're not equal, we're actually gonna assume that they are equal. So by way of a contradiction, assume that they are equal. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that there exists a bijective mapping from the power set of A to A. So then there exists, let's say I used alpha, so let's use beta from A to the power set of A. So we have beta maps A to the power set of A. This has to be one-to-one -one and onto because these are the same size. And so what I want to do is I want to find some type of contradiction. Well, what I can do is I'm going to end up finding something in the power set that can't get mapped onto. So therefore, because there's something in here that doesn't get mapped to, this cannot be onto. Therefore, it cannot be bijection. Therefore, these things cannot be the same. So what is my set going to be? Well, my set is going to be B is equal to the set of all A and A such that A is not an element of beta of A. So now beta is going to map each element of A to some subset. If a is in the subset that it gets mapped to, then A will not be in B. However, if A is an element, uh, or is not an element of the set that A gets mapped to, then it will be in here. So, beta is going to send all the things in A somewhere, and what we're going to say is we're going to define this set. Now, since we just said that beta was one-to-one -one and onto, then what we have to have is that beta of, let's say, C is equal to B for some C and A. So if it's an onto mapping, I have to get something that gets mapped to this set. All right. But that means that the elements in this set have to be the same as the elements in this set. Well, notice that if C is in beta of C, then C is not an element of B. And if C is not an element of beta of C, then C is an element of B. 
So what does that mean is that, well, at least at this one point, the two sets differ. Therefore, beta of C cannot be equal to B. Because if C is in here, then it's not in B. If C is in here, not in here, then it is in B. So therefore, those two sets can't be the same. Hence, beta of C cannot be equal to B for any C and A. Therefore, my mapping cannot be onto. So there exists no onto mappings from the set A to the power set of A. Therefore, there exists no bijections. So we get that the cardinality of A cannot be equal to the power set of A. We knew that this one was less than or equal to this one. So what we end up with is the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of A. All right. Just to take that one step further, and what does that mean is, well, if I take the set of natural numbers, they have an infinite cardinality. But if I find the power set of the natural numbers, this cardinality is going to be strictly bigger than the cardinality of the set of natural numbers. So what have we just done? So we found a number bigger than infinity. Because this is infinite, and this is strictly bigger. So this would be another type of infinity. So we get a bigger infinity. And so what we could say is, okay, if I have my first infinity, we'll call k0. There has to be a k1. But if I take the power set of this pet, I get another infinity. And another infinity. And I can keep going on forever. So how many different types of infinity are there going to be? Well, anytime I find one infinity, I can always find a bigger one. So there's going to be at least infinitely many infinities. Now, next we're going to show that the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly greater than the cardinality of the natural numbers. So what we have then is that the cardinality of the real numbers will not be countably infinite, so it'll be uncountably infinite. So what we have is, well, the size of the real numbers is bigger than the size of the natural numbers, so we have something bigger than L of naught, or something bigger than infinity. We next want to show that the set of real numbers has a bigger cardinality than the set of natural numbers. So how are we going to do that is, well, we have to show that there are no bijections from the real numbers to the natural numbers. And so I know that the power set of n is bigger than the cardinality of n. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, let's say, alpha from r to the power set of n that is onto. And what I get is that if alpha is onto, then the cardinality of r has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of the power set of n, which is strictly greater than the cardinality of the power or cardinality of n. Therefore, if I can find such a mapping, I know that the cardinality of r is strictly bigger than the cardinality of n. All right. So what would such a mapping look like? Well, if I take the set of real numbers, all real numbers can be written as a decimal. So I have some numbers here, point some numbers here. So x is equal to a bunch of things in here. And I could call this x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4. Now, normally you would say these are the points after the 1, so these are the negative ones. But I'm going to label this way just to help myself out. And I'm going to say this is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 negative 4, dot, dot, dot. And now I do have to stop somewhere on this end, but my real numbers can have an infinite decimal expansion, so I'm going to have an infinite decimal. So for any natural number, I'm going to have some number in here. Now, what I'm going to say is that I'm going to map alpha of x is going to be equal to the set consisting of, well, it's going to consist of n, all the n in n, such that my x sub n is not equal to 0. So now, actually, since it's just the natural numbers, I can start here. But the point is, if it's x1 is equal to 0, then 1 is not going to be in this set. If x1 is not equal to 0, then 1 is in this set. If x2 is equal to 0, then 2 is not in this set. But if this is non-zero, then it is in this set. What you'll notice is that, well, since I can pick 1 is either in there or not, 2 is in there or not, 3 is in there or not, 4 is in there or not, well, this will be mapped onto the set of subsets of natural numbers because I'll have all natural numbers in each of these sets. 
we can also get any subset of natural numbers because in order to find something that gets mapped there, I could say, let this be a set of natural numbers then. Well, if the number's in there, I'm gonna let this be one. Otherwise, I'm gonna let these be zero. So if I wanna know the set two, three, five, seven, my number's gonna look like, or one of the numbers that gets mapped there would be, I don't care what happens here, but one is zero, two, is one, three is one, then zero is the fourth slot, one is the fifth slot, zero is sixth, one for the seventh, and then all zeros the rest of the way. And this would get mapped to the set two, three, five, seven. So therefore there is some number that gets mapped to any subset of the natural numbers. So this is indeed an onto mapping. Therefore we found an onto mapping from R to the power set of N. So the cardinality of R is greater than or equal to the cardinality of the power set of N is strictly greater than the cardinality of N. Hence, the cardinality or the size of the real numbers is strictly bigger than the size of the natural numbers. On the other hand, if we look at the rational numbers, the rational numbers will be indeed countably infinite. So in order to show that, we'll have to prove that there is a bijection from the rational numbers to the natural numbers. All right, so now I want to show that the set of rational numbers is countable. So that is, there are as many rational numbers as there, are, as there are natural numbers. So there'd be more real numbers than rational numbers. Now what I want to do here is I want to say, okay, let's have a lemma first. Is Let's suppose that A is countably infinite. So that is, the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of N. And the cardinality of B is equal to the cardinality of N. Then what I claim is that the cardinality of A union B is also equal to the cardinality of n. So this is what I want to show is that if I take two countably infinite sets, then the union of two countably infinite sets is again countable. So if I take the union of these two sets, I'm going to end up with a countably infinite set. All right, how am I going to do that? So, well, the idea is that I can already see that A union B, this contains all the things in A and B, so this is greater than or equal to, say, the cardinality of A, which is equal to the cardinality of the set of natural numbers. So we know that the cardinality of the union of countably infinite sets is at least countably infinite. So what I have to do now is show that this is bigger than or equal to this. Well, how am I going to do that is, well, notice that, I do know that this is equal to the size of the integers, but the size of the integers is greater than or equal to the integers if I remove zero. So this is bigger than or equal to this. So what I can do is if I can find a mapping from this onto this, then I will show that this is bigger than or equal to this and I'll get that these all must be equal. So now, how am I going to find alpha from Z not zero to A union B? Well, what I do need to know is that, okay, alpha is, or A is equal to, in size, the set of natural numbers. So there has to exist some mapping, let's say gamma, from the natural numbers to the set A, which is one to one and on to. There also has to exist a, let's say, delta from the natural numbers to B, which is one to one and on to. So I know these exist, so let's define those as gamma and delta. What I'm gonna do for alpha is I'm gonna say alpha of x is equal to gamma of negative x if x is less than zero, and alpha of x is equal to delta of x if x is greater than zero. Now what that means is if I take a negative number, then when I plug it into alpha, the way I'm going to do that is take the negative of the negative number. So I'm going to end up with a natural number. Then I'm going to take that natural number and plug it into gamma, and I'm going to get out something in A. The same way, if I find something that's positive, I'm going to have a natural number. So I'm going to plug it into delta, so I'm going to get something in B. So this is going to be a well-defined mapping. Furthermore, since this is on to, gamma is on to. For everything in A, there exists a natural number which gets mapped to it. And for every natural number, there exists the negative of that number in the integers. So there exists an integer which ends up getting mapped to the things in A. And there exists an integer by the same reasoning that gets mapped to the things in B. So this mapping will indeed be on to.
therefore, the cardinality of z not 0 is greater than or equal to the cardinality of a union b. Combining that all together, we get that, yes, this must be the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers. Hence, we have that, okay, well, the set of natural numbers has the same cardinality a union b, so the union of two countably infinite sets is again countably infinite. So how am I going to use that? Well, the idea is that I'm going to first show that the positive rationals are countably infinite, which would mean that the negative rationals are countably infinite. So then if I want to find all rationals, that would be the positive rationals, union, the negative rationals, union, the element zero. So we would get that this would have to be countably infinite, union of countably infinite would be countably infinite, union of finite set is still going to be countably infinite. So if I can show that these are countably infinite, we get the union is countably infinite, therefore the rational numbers is countably infinite. So let's focus on the positive rational numbers. Well, I need to find a mapping. So I'm going to find an alpha from the natural numbers to the rational numbers where alpha is onto. If I can do that, that means that the cardinality of n is greater than or equal to the cardinality of q. But notice that every natural number is a rational number, therefore this is greater than or equal to this cardinality of the natural numbers. So I don't necessarily need a one-to-one -one onto, I just need an onto mapping from the set of naturals to the set of rationals. So what is that going to look like? Well, I'm going to write out my rationals, and the idea is that I can take 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and here I'd get 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, and then 2 over 1, 2 over 2, 2 over 3, 2 over 4, 3 over 1, 3 over 2, 3 over 3, 3 over 4, and I can finish this out, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4. And so I'm trying to list out my rational numbers. Now, I will get all of the rational numbers in this way, because every rational number is, every positive rational number is an integer divided by an integer. Since it's positive, it's going to be a natural number over a natural number. So we end up getting all of the positive rationals, if we continue off in that direction and that direction. Now, we do get some repeats here, so these are actually the same. So what's going to end up happening is if I can map my natural numbers to this thing, it's going to end up being not one to one because I'm going to have multiple things getting mapped to say one. So I'll send something to one over one, something to two over two and three over three, but I don't actually need it to be one to one. I just need it to be on two. So what would my mapping look like? Well, I'm going to call this one and this two three and four. So I'm going to go like this and then I'll say five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 25 and continue. So in order to show my mapping from n to q, I'm just drawing that pictorially and I end up with this weird zigzag thing where I start here and I work my way out and then I keep circling out. Now notice that the way I'm doing this, I'm going to end up getting all of the rational numbers. So I'm going to get all of the things in all of the rows and all the columns. So I therefore have a mapping from the set of rationals onto, or sorry, from the set of natural numbers onto the set of rationals. So therefore, the set of natural numbers is at least as big as the set of rationals, so the cardinalities of these two must be the same. Thank you for joining me today as we learned about cardinality of sets. And so as we went through, we found that there were different sizes of infinity, 